Hi, this is Anna Montejo. I am Publicity Chair for Newark Symphony Orchestra and Principal Oboe, and I am here to welcome our 2019 Betsy Elken Youth Competition winner. She has waited a very, very long time uh, to get to perform with Newark Symphony Orchestra, and so I'd like to do a nice warm welcome for uh, Viba Janaki Raman. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Viba. I am 15 years old and I play the violin and I am from Westchester, Pennsylvania, and I'm really glad to be here. I, I mean, it's been a long time in the planning because my initial concert, which was supposed to be last May, got canceled and we've just been trying to find a time for this to happen. But thanks to everybody on the NSO team, we were able to work it all out and I'm very excited. Viva, you have been extremely patient and and uh, we've been, you know, talking through behind the scenes. How can we get, you know, because you are a very special talent and and of course we would love to share the stage and have the full orchestra um, and but something tells me, you know, we, maybe we get another chance, you know, as the years go by. Yeah, so we're, we're very excited uh, to, to have you playing with our musicians and, and, to, and to be a soloist. Uh, can you tell me about where, where do you go to school? Um, I go to school at the Pennsylvania Leadership Charter Schools University Scholars Program. I know that's a lot of words. We just call it PALCS, USP, because it's easier to say. Um, but it's an online program, actually that allows me to just study virtually. I do have like Zoom classes and virtual lessons and assignments that I complete, but that's actually what I was doing pre-pandemic as well. So it was a pretty seamless change for me. Um, but yeah, it's been working really well to have that online experience and accommodate for violin. So that's that free up your schedule and, and you pace yourself with some classes and and like, are you, you just have more control of your schedule? Yeah, a little bit. It just allows me to have more flexibility in when in the day I choose to do what. And it's just been really helpful in being able to accommodate rehearsals. I mean, when I used to go out and play with other people, it was really helpful to not have any restrictions based on when my school day starts and ends. Right. And actually, if you could... Um maybe talk about some of those places that you have played because uh, when I looked at your bio and I saw all these main venues that are very recognizable names can you can you share some of those experiences um, and and how you had the opportunity to play at these places sure so I guess I'll start with my most recent experience which is um, studying at the Juilliard pre-college division um, this has been my second year in that program so not too long but while I was there in person we got to perform in the halls at Juilliard that are right around the Lincoln Center and it's just a really inspiring experience to be so in such close proximity to kind of like the center of classical music on the east coast sure yeah that's just been a great place in terms of getting to work with amazing peers and orchestra and also in all my chamber music ensembles because I am a big fan of chamber music. So that's, I guess, my most recent um, performance venue. And but in your past, uh, um, um, my, my eyes are going a little bit because I, I know I have some other notes here. I, I noticed um, there are some other venues that that you have performed at and and so um the with the met philadelphia um carnegie hall mm -hmm. how did you how did you arrive at carnegie hall so with carnegie hall um it was years ago when i was uh, studying at the music school of delaware which is very close to newark and, um, and working with maybe simeone <laughs> our music also, director that was also along the time i was working with um, around the time I was working with Maestro and that was actually another experience I had was getting to go to Italy on tour with the Delaware Youth Symphony Orchestra with him. Um, that that means you went with my sons. <laughs> That's Alex and Leo Fain uh, traveled on that trip as well. 
Yes. So Although, you were younger. You were younger then. Yeah, I was. I I was ten, turning eleven. I think something like that. I see. So you had a parent join you on that trip. Yeah. Okay. So my dad accompanied me on that trip, but that was an incredible performance experience because we got to play at several venues and tour Italy, which was really great. But um, going back to the sure um, my Carnegie Hall experience, I got to go with the Suzuki program there, and we all went and performed a bunch of pieces as a group. And again, just being on that stage is like one of those memorable first big musical experiences. So that was just a great, I had a great time. Well, now the question is, did you buy the merchandise? Because there's a, you know, a famous saying on how you arrived to, you know, Carnegie, <laughs> Carnegie Hall. Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> That's, that's wonderful. Uh, also, Kimmel Center. Uh, I see in the Man, uh, the Man Center for Performing Arts. Um, yeah, those were both um, uh, look, venues I got to perform at with the Philadelphia Youth Orchestras programs. Okay. So um, I was in the PYAO, which is the Philadelphia Young Artists Orchestra, for a couple yes. of years. And I, again, had a wonderful time there. And we got to perform at the Kimmel Center in both halls for various different performances. And in my last year there, I also got to perform a concerto with the orchestra, which was just a really great way of saying goodbye to all of the experiences I had in their various ensembles. And that summer, I got to perform at the Mann Center with, with PYO, the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra, with um, the conductor, of the Philadelphia Orchestra, Yannick Nisenski. Ah, when, what was that like? That was incredible. I mean, on that stage, the amount of energy and life that he can bring to the orchestra and to the music is remarkable. I think- Are you still resonating? You know, are you still, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's still, you know, churning in you? Definitely. I mean, it's everybody on the stage, I, can, I could sense felt really energized with having them con with having him conduct and just the amount of vitality that he brought um, while conducting us was amazing. That's great. What a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, so uh, you're at 15, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so at 15, uh, I, I see in your bio, you started the violin at six. And can you talk about how you chose the violin? And, and uh, you know, how you got that at a very young age, you got it started and how you decided to stick with it. I think I don't have a particularly inspirational story for this. I know a lot of people have a great beginning story, but for me, I think I'd always liked music and I sort of grew up surrounded by music because my grandfather is a professional South Indian classical musician and musicologist. And so that culture and tradition and the music that accompanies with accompanies it um, was just a part of my life since forever. <laughs> and so I think when I was around five or six, my parents and I decided that it would be great for me to start an instrument in the Western classical tradition. And I think violin was just kind of the most accessible and well-known instrument perhaps. And okay. So we went to the music school of Delaware and we signed up for lessons. And ever since then, it's just been a really core part of my life. And I mean, even now I would say that it's not the instrument that makes as much of a difference to me as just being able to play music. Like anybody who knows me knows that I just am a huge fan of uh, the piano repertoire and piano music and pianists. And so for me, regardless of what instrument I would, I would have started on, um, I think I would still be sticking with music today. And that's what I would want to do in my life. Well, there, there must be a sweet spot for the violin. You I know? mean, definitely. I, definitely. I, if I had the choice to change my instrument, I wouldn't. I, I've, just because of how long I've grown with it and all the experiences I've had with it. But it is music first and the instrument second for me. I know for some people, they have the experience where their connection to their instrument that they play is um, what's first and foremost for them. But mm -hmm. for me, I think the instrument is only secondary to my connection with music. 
Nice, nice. Well, um, you talked about how at your school you were already virtual, and 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 so when the pandemic, um, you know, we went into lockdown. March of 2020. Gosh, you know, the time is <laughs> really, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, it's going by much, uh, you know, faster. Um, and so um, you described maybe not much of a change. It was, it was more seamless, but may, uh, maybe talk about how that impacted your ensembles and, and how um, the different places you would get out to and arrive for rehearsals and, and, and talk about what this past year has been for you as a musician, how you've been impacted by the pandemic. So things have been drastically different. Um, in March, Juilliard went completely virtual. So all of my lessons and chamber music and orchestra were all adapted to Zoom. And my Zoom lessons have been a great experience because my wonderful teacher, Miss Catherine Cho, she is able to convey everything that um, I need through Zoom. And so I'm very privileged to be able to be studying with her and to still have a great lesson experience for the past year. And with ensembles, it was a little bit tricky because obviously you can't play with other people through Zoom, but it was a great opportunity to study ensemble music and study scores, listen to music with um, with my peers and really like you would you do that as an entire ensemble yeah like, would they have a zoom with the full orchestra yeah so we would be on zoom with the full orchestra and typically our conductor or if it was chamber music our coach would lead the sessions and each week we would maybe compare and contrast various recordings of a certain piece or different styles of approaching the same work or just delve into a composer's background and their compositional style. Um, a lot of really great work that I think when we're in person, we often miss the opportunity to do. Yeah, um, Zoe talked about that too. She was one of our 2020 uh, honorable mentions. And um, uh, and, and so, but, but yeah, that, that's, that's really fascinating because I, I don't think for my for myself uh, studying music that I really had an opportunity to get behind the scenes and the history until I was in college, and and so um, what you're going through, if you were in person rehearsing, they wouldn't talk so much, right? <laughs> no, definitely not. We want to make use of our time fully, but things like score study or analyzing the music, just comparing recordings and analyzing harmony are just things that I absolutely love doing. So being able to do it with my peers in that setting is really a great joy for me. Yeah, so did it, how did that impact your playing, getting that additional insight? I think it definitely impacts your approach to music and your approach to the pieces that you're playing. I think when you have that insight and background you're able to try to reflect that in your playing and it just gives you a more holistic understanding of the music and I think it's it's a great experience to have but it also is quite challenging not being able to put all of that into practice right because I mean you can have all this information but until you actually get to go out and utilize it in performance, it's just sort of sitting there. And I think that's why a lot of artists have experienced like musical blocks this past year because performing and engaging with other musicians in person is such a core part of musical development. And so it's really great now to be able to sort of reflect on all of those things in a performance setting um, when I perform with the orchestra this weekend. Well, will this uh, be the first performance for you? Or have you had another opportunity uh, in this past year to, to perform? I have had a, an opportunity in December. I got to perform with my string quartet. Uh, we played uh, Beethoven Opus 132, which is just one of my favorite works of all time. And so that was a, I mean, a much smaller scale performance. There were only four of us. 
but that was also a very freeing experience being able to perform in person for so long I mean yes. for the first time in so long but I have had zoom performances in recitals or um so recitals. with your with an accompanist like you uh you would would you have an accompanist in the room with you in that performance no I I just never happened to have access to them in the past year but oh, okay I just played by myself or played solo works where I didn't need accompaniment over Zoom for virtual concerts or master classes, um, recitals, those kinds of things. So I still got the opportunity to play in some sort of a live setting. Right, but I, uh, Viva, how about I had read that you were um, a winner or, or selected with the From the Top show in 2020. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's really phenomenal. Um, please tell us more about that. Sure. So that's actually a great segue because that was one of the programs through which I was able to perform in a virtual concert and also be on their radio show. So um, the From the Top community is just wonderful. It was really great to meet with everybody and engage with everybody and just be inspired by all my fellow young musicians. Um, but being on the radio show, I got to perform a new work called Darshan by Rina Ismail. And the reason that work was so significant to me is because it combines elements of South or Indian classical music and Western classical music. And so for me, it was like combining both of the musical systems that I am a part of. And so it was a really fascinating experience to just combine those different elements and create a final product that I felt was reflected of both styles, but also created something new. So it was really but fascinating. How did, how did you find that piece? I, I loved it. So no. for me, like, how did you find it? Oh, how did I find it? Yes. Yeah. Well, the, the producers at From the Top suggested that I play one of uh, Rina Ismail's works. And so uh, we were just working together and finding what would be the best fit for me. And I just sort of stumbled across this recording on YouTube when I was looking at some of her other works. And immediately I was sort of like, that's, that's the one I have to play because it's a really an enchanting work almost. I mean, it really draws you in and the emotional narrative it tells is I feel so, so compelling. So I just sort of found it on YouTube one day and I figured that that was- Are there recordings available? I mean, I um, is there, a, do they keep, um, you know, the videos, uh, do they keep that available? So is that accessible? Is this- the, Your performance? Oh, my performance. Um, it's still on the From the Top website and probably, I mean, all of their previous uh, shows are saved on their website and also anywhere that you can get your podcasts. Um, you can find the show that I was on and it'll be there. Great. We'll make sure we get a link in there for you. That's, that's awesome. And, and uh, so during that pandemic, that also meant the, the, the Bach um, piece you're going to play this Sunday uh, was was you know prepared a long time ago and and so what was that like to have it all done and and you are announced the winner and now here you know and then here we are and and waiting that much time so um well I'm I apologize I'm assuming it was the same selection or did you switch so we had to switch given the pandemic we had to downsized to a string orchestra, which is why I chose the Bach Concerto. I actually won the competition with Tchaikovsky Concerto, which is oh. what we, I, I was planning to play last May with the full orchestra, but um, I did, I was supposed to play the Bach um, in December actually, but that also got postponed. So I did sort of study it and then had it sitting on the shelf for a while and then brought it back a few weeks ago for this program. So you still had to do it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it was really uh, great studying it because that concerto um, is typically one that people learn. It's like one of the first uh, concertos that people learn when they're studying the violin, but it was one that I actually missed. I just happened to never do it. 
And being able to study it now just offered a totally different perspective on the piece because I found that I was just able to really delve into all of the details and nuances that Bach writes. And um, it was just really great for me to explore sound and articulation and all of these ideas that had I studied it when I was younger, I probably wouldn't have been able to, um, I guess, study with that level of depth. Right, right. The having that kind of, you know, um, it's a more detailed interpretation and in, in your, and, and I'm sure your musicality is, uh, you know, further developed as well. You know, I so I know so. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I wanted to um, ask you, uh, you know, so at 15, and, and you mentioned you started at six. And so if you, you know, go back to being that six year old starting on a violin, or if you, you know, maybe your task through summer camps or something to go be the teacher of these, you know, young, young players. Um, how would you encourage them to stick with it? I think within music, it's really important to find what aspects of it or what mediums resonate with you the most and what brings you the most joy and satisfaction and use that as a reason to always remember why you do what you do. Because when you're playing an instrument, there will always be several periods of time where things aren't going the way you want or you feel like your progress isn't um, where you, how you would like it to be. And I mean, I still experience those quite frequently. And so I think it's helpful to know what I love about music and to remind myself of that. And also, as difficult as it may be when you feel like you're constantly running out of time, um, really appreciate every step of the journey that you're taking and how with each day that you practice, you're discovering something new. And it's not just about solving the problems that you have to deal with, but it's also about discovering things about music, things about yourself, how you work and how you think and what you need to do to play your best. So really, if you're going through a period of time like that, know that those are the periods of time that allow growth to happen and will eventually allow you to feel your freest and most connected to the music that you're playing. Viva, are you sure you're 15? <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> those are very wise words. I don't yeah. know that I always follow that advice. I get very- Well, nervous. you know what? You know, putting it out there and saying it, I would say that, 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 that that's, the, that's part of your vision, right? That's part of your heart and your vision and, and how, you, how you allow yourself to move forward and continue, right? And, that, and that's part of the journey is, is we choose things and, and do we choose to, to uh, give it our attention and energy and continue with it? Mm -hmm. And, and I, and there's always, no matter what you choose, there's always room to nitpick and be the critic and find, you know, the areas that you want to do better. But the truth is, there's got to be something we like, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I would imagine, um, you know, you, you have yet to really say like the one thing about the violin that really, really resonates. I know, I know you painted this picture, how much you love music. And I really, truly believe that, but there's, there's gotta be something that, that really makes you uh, really sing with the violin. I think that's a difficult concept to put into, put into words, but I think there's something about how the way that the bow sits in the string and the relationship between the bow and the string that really, I guess, connects what you're doing physically to how you feel about the music. It's mm -hmm. just for string instruments, particularly, particularly, I find that it's so natural to put your voice into what you're doing. 
I think in with other instruments, that's at least from my perspective, it seems like that would be more challenging just because of how you physically play the instrument. But with the violin, like the instrument is right here, it's right under my ear. So I feel like my hands and my ear and the bow and the string are all sort of connected in a very accessible way. And I think it's like you're hugging, you're hugging it and singing to yourself. In fact, I would love for you to, uh, you know, grab your violin now. (laughs) And, and, um, and if you could give us a sampling of of the Bach that our audience is going to be so lucky to hear that's this Sunday, on May 23rd at 3pm for our virtual concert. Uh, So please, let's hear your beautiful sound. This is an excerpt from the second movement, the slow movement. Um, This is just a phrase that I particularly love. Thank you, Viva. That was beautiful. Thank you. And I and I know it's gonna it's gonna just be really special. And um, so, not just I'm, I'm sure with all the hours you put into the violin, I'm sure there's just a little bit of time for you to do other things. And and uh, and what may those other interests or activities be? Well even when I'm not playing violin, I'm usually doing something musical or listening to music. But outside of music, I also study Sanskrit, um, which is just really, I guess, intellectually stimulating for me. I mean, it's a really beautiful language with so much culture behind it. And so for me, it's a great way to connect with my culture, but also just studying a language like that, which has so many intricacies, is also really just interesting. Where, where do you get to study? Th- where do you get to study that? Um, so there's a program called uh, Sanskrit as a Foreign Language through a program called Samskrit Bharati, and nice. they offer a course for high schoolers that actually allows you to take that as your high school language. That will also, you know, be, appear on your transcript. So it's really worked out well for me to be able to study that. that that's amazing. I, I can't say that I've ever talked to another who's actively studying that language. So um, that's wonderful. Good luck with that. Okay. And, and I'm sure it, it'll combine, you know, taking that in combination with music, right? Like, I mean, music is, is a language. That's all. It's, it's, it's the universal language. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, um, that, I feel like you're very, you know, very symbol, very picture, very visual oriented, you know, um, you know, to, to be, to have those as language studies. And are there, are there other, um, other hobbies um, that you enjoy? Um, well, outside of that, I also play the Indian violin. I know that's also music, but also a totally different experience. Um, and how, how does that instrument, how, how is that shaped differently than your violin? So it's just the same as any other violin, but the strings are tuned differently. So they have a fixed dough system 
where, um, or I guess a movable dough system actually, but within a piece, the dough doesn't change at all. So there's no modulation. So because of that, they're able to tune their strings. Um, they're, they're able to tune their strings in a way that only is reflective of that one dough. And so that's the only thing that's a little bit different about it. And you also- Do you tune, do you tune your own violin or do you have a separate violin that you keep tuned? I have a separate instrument that I keep just because okay. I wouldn't want to constantly be- Yeah, that's what I, I was just curious how, how you handle that. But we hold our instrument this way and we actually sit while playing. So that's the other big difference, but the instrument itself is the same. Wow, and now do you have other family members who play? Um, a couple of cousins, but no, um, no one in my immediate family, just my grandfather who sings, who's a great source of inspiration. You didn't, not your mom or dad? You got to skip? <laughs> wow. All right. Well, Viva, it, uh, it's been such a pleasure talking with you, and I would really love to hear where you see yourself, you know, not, not after high school, not, um, you know, directly into college, but let's let's really go past and and talk about where you may be in ten years. So that puts you around twenty five or so. What are some dreams of yours that that you like to uh, um, unfold for you? It's so hard to see that far into the future, and I I always want to keep an open mind and not be set on any one thing. But I think I would be happy with music as a profession in any capacity so i'm not really set on one specific avenue um i really love chamber music and um i would hope that that would be a big part of my music making in some way or another and i also really love teaching um and i just being able to help other musicians find their voice and sound their best um, when I'm at the point where I'm able to teach um, younger students would just be really fulfilling to me. So I guess a mix of teaching and performing in various different, um, various different ensembles with various instrumentations, just being able to have a lot of variety. I, I think there's something telling me there's composition going on too. I, I, I recall, didn't you, um, is, did you mention you enjoy composition? Well, when I was younger, that was something I used to do, but okay. I don't think I was ever particularly good. <laughs> the challenge that I've had in recent years is that every time I start writing something, it turns into a piece of music that already exists just because I listen to so much music. And so I think composition isn't the path for me, but it, it is something that I enjoyed doing when I was younger. Well, time will tell. You got a lot of great influences and a lot of beautiful talent. So time will tell. Whatever it is, you'll be standing tall. <laughs> Viva, thank you so much. And, you so and we, uh, we're, this will be our final uh, concert for the season. We ran the whole season virtually. And so what a pleasure that, that we'll be uh, sharing our, our outdoor stage. <laughs> Uh, with you, um, but I really, really hope you share with your family and and your friends and um, an extended family and extended music ensemble friends that that uh, you'll be performing, and it, it's going to be great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been it's been a great experience.